Okay, before uh, starting, some, some of you asked me about uh, the weekend. There is nothing uh, organized by the school, and uh, the, the main reason is that you are, you are really too many <laughs> to, to bring you around. Uh, so if you, have, uh, if you want some ideas, unfortunately the weather will not uh, be very nice, uh, but if you want to have some ideas of what you can do in the city or the, in the nearby, uh, there is a, a map and, uh, on, uh, which is uh, at the info point, and uh, there are a bunch of things that you can do um, in Trieste, in the city, or in uh, outdoor, in the surroundings. Um, okay, this afternoon we'll have uh, the last lecture uh, on dark energy, and then uh, we'll have uh, a sort of special seminar, uh, which um, will be about uh, um, experimental uh, search for uh, gravitational waves. Okay, we start with uh, the fourth lecture of uh, Kazuya. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, so I continue with the observational test and I try to give you some introduction to nonlinear structure formation. I said that uh, for dark energy, uh, if dark energy is complicated, you have to specify pressure, perturbations, and anisotropic stress. But alternative way is to just parameterize your modified Einstein equations instead of introducing these additional uh, quantities. And in the end, you get is the modification of the relation between Newton potential and your dark matter density and the relation between phi and psi. And you can have any function of space and time. So this is a wave number, and this is a time. And you can have two functions of time and space to describe the modification of Einstein equations. And of course, you can combine this to get a different parameterizations. So this is another set of parameterizations. As I said, that the lensing is determined by phi plus psi half. So it is more uh, useful sometimes to define the relation between lensing potential and density perturbations. And sigma is just a combination of mu and the eta. So in this case, mu and the sigma are the two functions describing the modification of gravity. So I say modification of gravity, but in fact, what we are looking at is the deviations from smooth stack energy, because for smooth stack energy, you have no corrections to these equations, so mu and sigma stays one. So this is looking for a derivation, deviations from smooth stack energy. Okay? And then, again, emphasizing again that combining two different ways to look at structure formation is very important. So we grinding measures phi plus psi half. Peculiar velocities, uh, resistive distortions measures the peculiar velocity of matter. And this is determined by psi. And so psi is determined by this function mu and density. And looking at the evolution equation for density, this mu appears here. So this is the evolution equation for density. So this means that the peculiar velocity sigma, which determines resistive distortions, only cares about this mu function. Okay. So if you just use resistive distortions, so this is a constraint of mu and sigma, I assume a very simple time uh, evolution. So this mu one and sigma one are constant. <coughs> If just use RSD, uh, resistive distortions, um, this is a constraint from SDSS, and you get just a constraint on this mu. So there's no constraint on sigma. But if you use weak lensing, so weak lensing is determined by phi plus psi, so this is sensitive to this sigma function. But at the same time, this is also determined by delta. So delta is determined by mu, so there is a degeneracy between mu and sigma. So Lensing is sensitive to both mu and sigma. So this means that if you use just one proof, like the weak lensing or RSD, you get a huge degeneracy, and you cannot really say anything about these functions. But combining these two, now you get this constraint. Okay? So this is using a real data from SDSS and weak lensing from CFHTLS. At the moment, the constraint is very weak. You see this is three. So this is really order one constraint. But you can see that lambda CDM is, of course, consistent. And you maybe also uh, try to do the model independent test I discussed for equation of state. 
So you have two functions depending on wave number and time, so rest shift. So you make bins in terms of rest shift and wave number. So this is a two-dimensional function. And treat mu and sigma in each bin as three parameters. But then you can use the same technique, the principal component analysis, by combining these two parameters, so not two, the many parameters to form and correlated parameters. And we try to see the deviations from one. So this parameter is constructed so that it becomes zero if you have smooth dark energy. And if it, uh, it, this is non-zero, this means that uh, there is something beyond uh, smooth dark energy. So this is one example we did in 2010. So we used just two bins in Z and two bins in K. So basically you have eight parameters describing deviations from smooth dark energy. Combining these eight parameters in a suitable way create these eight uncorrelated parameters, and these error bars are uncorrelated. And if you find the deviation from zero, this indicates that there is something going on beyond the smooth dark energy. And in 2010, we find there are three parameters you can constrain at like 5 to 10% level. And we find one mode deviating from zero at two sigma level. So this means that there is something going on. And at that time, so we used the weak lensing data from CFHTLS, and later we found out that there is a systematic in this weak lensing measurement, and this is driven by this systematic. So unfortunately, this is not the evidence of the deviation from lambda CDM. But this indicates that using this kind of method, you can really find uh, deviations from simple smooth dark energy model. But at the same time, this indicates that you have to be very careful about your observational systematic, because observational systematic can fool you to have some deviations. So again, it's good to talk about the latest constraint. The again, Planck paper, 2015, gave a constraint on this mu and sigma. So they use a slightly different time dependence using dark energy density. So they fix some uh, time evolution and constrain this mu bar and sigma bar and they reconstruct it mu and sigma today. Okay? So this is constant, but uh, remember that they assumed some very special time dependence. So again, they use Planck and background observations like supernovae, weak lensing, BAO, RST, and combined everything. So in their notation, mu zero minus one zero is uh, lambda CDM. So sigma one, uh, sigma minus one zero is the lambda CDM. So this is lambda CDM. And you notice that the contour somehow tries to escape from lambda CDM. And looking at this, if you combine everything, there is a three sigma hint of deviation from lambda CDM. So this is the current status. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they tried a different parameterizations, but the fact that there is a two, three sigma deviation, it remains the same. They didn't probably do that. So let's look into a little bit why this deviation uh, come from. So there are two things. One is the uh, lensing. So CME lensing, I said that, is the measuring this phi plus psi. And there is a known tension in lambda CDM that the lensing measured from power spectrum of CMB, you need a little bit larger amplitude compared with lambda CDM. So they parameterize this A lens. So this is one in lambda CDM, but they introduce some additional parameter to enhance the lensing, and they find that they need slightly larger lensing for CMB. And this modified gravity, or the deviation from smooth dark energy parameters, you can do that using this sigma. So remember that sigma is describing the lensing. So if you make sigma larger than one, you can enhance your lensing. So you can explain this. So basically, 
in order to explain this lensing anomaly, you need to have sigma larger than one. So that's the reason why contour is shifted toward uh, this way, so sigma must be larger than one. But this is not the only reason, and there is another probably more interesting uh, tension with lambda CDM in Planck data. So if you measure the amplitude of fluctuations uh, using CMB, you can predict what is the amplitude today. And you can compare this amplitude with the amplitude you measure from weak lensing. So they use CFHTLS again. And comparing this amplitude, they notice that the amplitude measured by weak lensing is smaller than the amplitude you expect in lambda CDM. So in this case, the amplitude is smaller. But in order to explain this lensing anomaly, you wanted to have larger uh, lensing sigma. So you cannot use sigma, but you can use this mu parameter because weak lensing, as I said, is sensitive to both sigma and mu. So what you can do is to suppress your growth by making mu smaller than one. Okay? Mu smaller than one means that the gravity is weaker. Once the gravity is weaker, the density grows slowly. This uh, suppresses the lensing. So that means that you can explain this by making mu smaller than one. So that's the reason why the contour uh, becomes uh, like this. So you want to have larger sigma to explain CMB lensing. You want to have smaller mu to explain weak lensing measurement. So that's the current status, and we still need to see whether this is due to, again, systematics in the weak lensing measurement. Just to mention that there is another way to measure CMB lensing using tri-spectrum. So this is the four-point functions instead of pass spectrum. And in fact, we do not see this uh, anomaly. So it seems there is an internal tension within Planck data. So we still need to see. But it's interesting that we are now getting some evidence that there is something going on beyond the simple smooth stack energy model. So I just probably skip the details. So the Planck paper also tried theoretical based parameterizations. So I will not go through this. But um, so I'm using a very phenomenological two parameters, but there is a way to parameterize directly the action. But then you get like uh, six free functions of time instead of two functions of space and time. And they did the constraint on just one parameter, assuming very simple time dependence. But theoretically, this is a very interesting way, and I encourage you to looking at the recent papers because now there is a modified Boltzmann code is available. So you can play with these parameters and you can predict everything using this code. But I have to say that it is a very challenging task to constrain uh, six free functions. However, the future is bright. So this is try to see how well we can constrain this parameter. So let's focus on mu, for example. So this is the principal component number, meaning that how many parameters in this mu function you can constrain. So this is a function of time and space. So you can parameterize this in many ways. So there are basically number of parameters you can constrain. So this is the errors. And this is the constraint from the current observations. So this is a bit old using double map, but the Planck doesn't change much. So this means that there's only one parameter which can be constrained, and the constraint is like 40, 50%. So that's the current status. However, now the dark energy survey is ongoing. So this is a weak lensing measurement, so imaging survey. So you, uh, they take image of galaxies and measure the shape. So this is a weak lensing experiment. EBOS is looking at the position of the galaxies so you can measure RSD. And you see that using this dark energy survey, the constraint is improved a lot. So you now have four or five parameters constrained at 20% level. But now, as I said, combining weak lensing and RSD, even by 2018, you may get one to three parameters less than 10% accuracy. 
So within three years, there will be a transition in our knowledge of these parameters, and we will get a very good constraint on these parameters, so deviations from simple lambda CDM model uh, at 5 to 10 percent level. And in fact, in 2020, Euclid satellite will be launched. So this will do both weak lensing and RST. And in fact, this is a, a future forecast. You will get like 10 parameters constrained at 1% level. So after 2020, so these parameters are precisely measured. So that's the reason why uh, people want to do these experiments. So we are talking about dark energy survey and EVO survey today, but then after 2020, we have next stage experiment. So I talked about Euclid. So this blue one is imaging. So this is, will do weak lensing. So this measures phi plus psi. Red one will do the less shift distortions. This will measure the peculiar velocities, so measures the Newton potential. So it's very good to have both of them. So Euclid will do the both. We have very large weak lensing survey, LSST, we have a very big spectroscopic survey, DESI. So having all these, we expect that within 10 years, 15 years, we will know much about these parameters, parameterizing C deviation from uh, simple lambda CDM. So I, I hope uh, I convinced you that that's the reason why people are interested in these huge surveys and the reason why they want to do both of these uh, surveys. So this is what we want to do. So in the first two lectures, I talked about theoretical ideas of dark energy. And in fact, we don't know what it is. So that's the question. So we need to know what is the dark energy theory. And then we want to parameterize the uh, structure formation. I introduced these two parameters, mu and sigma, in the end. Just to describe structure formations, you just need to know uh, these two functions in terms of space and time. Then using uh, observations, you can deconstruct or constrain these parameters, and then hopefully you fill the gap between the two. And this kind of thing can be done in the next 10 years, but there are a lot of problems, and there are a lot of reasons that we fail. For example, as I said, if you have observational systematics, this can fool you to have some modifications. The problem is that there are so many models, so how we parameterize mu and sigma, and at the moment, for example, this theoretical approach have too many functions. So even for the future surveys, it's not very clear we can really constrain these many functions. So this is open questions, so there are a lot of things uh, you can Welcome. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so let's move on. So, so far, it looks like we have a very good uh, framework to test generalized dark energy model. However, there is a very important things uh, hidden in the assumption. So I used a linear perturbation theory and this mu and sigma parameters can be used only for linear theory. However, the weak lensing and uh, uh, let's see if distortions, both you need to understand nonlinear uh, clustering. So nonlinearity, you can see this in the power spectrum. So you compute the power spectrum of density perturbation of dark matter, and then you get this power spectrum as a function of wave number. And this basically measures the amplitude of these density perturbations. So this is the plot of the path spectrum, so starting at let's say 5.5. This is 2.5, 1, and 0. So this growth is described by linear growth function I de uh, derived. Okay? So you can de uh, describe this changing amplitude with let's shift on very large scales, again, small k means large scales, using linear theory very well. So this dotted line 
are uh, from simulations. Blue lines are linear theory. So linear theory is doing very well at small k. But then you notice that simulation curve deviates from linear theory at high k. And these deviations happen smaller and smaller k at late times. Okay? This is a nonlinearity. Okay? So the density becomes large because density grows like scale factor. Even if dark energy suppresses the growth, density becomes nonlinear at some point, then you cannot trust linear theory. So this is the ratio between this full path spectrum compared with linear path spectrum, removing the baryon acoustic oscillations so that you can see these oscillations very well. So linear prediction is always here. The always amplitude is constant. But this is a full path spectrum. And you see that if redshift becomes smaller and smaller, you see the enhancement of your path spectrum. This is coming from the nonlinearity. And if you do the observations at less shift, uh, lower less shift, then you have to worry about all these nonlinearity. Yeah. So this smooth is a linear path spectrum, but I removed these baryon oscillations. So by removing this, you see these oscillations. But because we use the linear path spectrum, the amplitude is always one. Yeah. So this one is non-linear path spectrum. Linear path spectrum, yes. It smooth means that I removed this baryon acoustic oscillations by hand. That's right, so this is a non-linear. Yeah, that I will talk about later. So why this is important? So I said that uh, I want to use weak lensing and less shift distortions to do the test. So let's look at the uh, impact of this non-linear uh, effect on the convergence path spectrum. So as I said, the convergence determines the uh, measurement of your shapes of galaxies. So this is what you want to measure from the observations. So in this case, you measure this from simulations. So this dotted line is the simulations. So this is the multiple. So this is similar to K. So for large L, you are looking at the small scales. Small L, you are looking at uh, large scales. So this is the prediction from linear theory. Okay. So this is the simulation result. So all of this enhancement comes from nonlinearity. So if you use linear theory, you get a completely wrong answer here. Why this is important? If we look at the predictions with different dark energy models, so this is a forward gravity model, for example. This is the constant dark energy equation of state model. All these lines are different, and you want to distinguish between these lines. But then you see that on large scales, we have cosmic variance because you can observe only a finite mode. So the error bars are large. But you see that the linear theory, you can trust up to only 100 here. So the difference between different models are hidden inside the cosmic variance. And the interesting difference happens on nonlinear scales where you cannot use linear theory. So you really need to understand the nonlinear clustering. This is already a problem in Lambda CDM, and you need uh, computer simulations. So you had a nice uh, lectures on that. By including our uh, complicated stack energy model, you have the same problem, but the problem becomes more complicated. So this is the same for uh, receive distortions measurement. So let's use distortions because of the peculiar velocity of galaxies. Along the line of sight, your clustering is enhanced. So the path spectrum becomes anisotropic. This depends on your line of sight. And then this mu is the angle between your line of sight and the wave number. And you can expand this in terms of Legendre function. So this is a Legendre function. And you can look at the monopole and the quadrupole. 
And you can compute this using linear theory I showed. So this is a simple case of lambda CDM. So you have the clustering of density in the relative space. This is depending on the uh, growth rate, F, and we want to measure this. How we do that? We measure the spectrum in less shift to space, do the, this decomposition, looking at the monopole and the quadrupole, taking the ratio, and this is a function of F. So you can measure the growth rate. Okay. So now we try to predict this monopole. So this is a monopole, P0. Again, uh, I normalize this using linear, smooth, uh, power spectrum, so linear theory prediction is always constant, so this dotted line is a linear prediction. So it's always constant at any less shift, so this is a linear prediction. Okay? Again, the data is from simulations, so this is what you will measure, and you see that at high less shift, linear theory is doing fine, but at lower less shift, you see that simulation results are completely different from linear theory. So then if you use linear prediction and try to measure F just using linear theory, you get a completely wrong answer. And this is more uh, serious for the quadrupole. So this is a quadrupole, P2. Even at Z equals 1, this is linear theory. So this is what you measure. So it's completely different. So this means that you really understand the nonlinear physics. Yeah. So the question is why the deviation is larger for uh, quadrupole. So quadrupole is mainly coming from velocity, velocity power spectrum. And it is known that the nonlinearity is more important for velocity. So what happens is that on large scales, you have a coherent this motion. And this is the origin of velocity divergence spectrum. But on small scales, you have a lot of velocity uh, dispersions. This erase this coherent motion. And you see this dumping. So this means that the amplitude of this coherent motion is destroyed. So maybe uh, you will hear more about this next week in the large scale structure uh, lectures. But the fact is that basically this is determined by the power spectrum of velocities. And the velocities have larger nonlinearity. So you see this dumping because of this nonlinearity. Yeah, monopole is coming from delta, so density, density power spectrum. So this is basically density, density power spectrum. So this is density, velocity, and velocity, velocity power spectrum. OK? So this means that we have to understand the nonlinear structure formation. And I don't think I have time to, of course, explain all the nonlinear structure formation. But again, the idea is that I don't want to use gravitational theory to describe nonlinear structure formation, because in some cases, people start from GR and then discuss nonlinear structure formation. But we want to apply this to general dark energy or even modified gravity, so I try not to use any gravitational theory in the derivations and try to understand what you have to do if you want to understand the dark energy model. So one way to do the nonlinear structure formation is to use a fluid approximations. So let's treat dark matter particles, a collection of these uh, dark matter particles as a pressureless fluid, and use the Newtonian theory to describe the dynamics of this fluid. Okay. And if you remember the fluid dynamics in the Newtonian theory, we have two equations. One is the continuity equation, so this describes the uh, conservation of energy of the fluid. This is the Euler equation, so mu is the velocity of the fluid. This is free nonlinear in terms of the variables of fluid. So density can be nonlinear and velocity can be nonlinear. The only assumption is that this is driven by Newtonian force, Newtonian potential. So in cosmology, we want to separate the expanding universe. So what we do is to use the commoving coordinate this is scaled by the scale factor, and I remove 
the expansion contribution to the velocity. So this just comes from the fact that the universe is expanding. And we are interested in these velocity perturbations. But I said perturbations, but this V can be as large as possible here. I just separate background and inhomogeneous part. I do the same for density perturbations, but again, this density perturbation can be as large as possible. Okay. So by doing that, the previous equations can be written in this form. So this is the continuity equation. This is the Euler equation. And maybe this looks familiar to the equations I used for linear perturbations. And in fact, as we, I will see, you will see that uh, this includes that linear uh, equations. To, to see that, uh, we need to change variable. So again, I use the velocity divergence, so theta instead of V. Uh, changing V to theta and using conformal time, we get these two equations. And if you remember what you compared with the lecture note uh, last time, so you have a nonlinear term like delta times theta and V times delta. But if you forget about all this nonlinear term, so this is delta prime equals minus h theta. This is what we had before. And for the Euler equations, we have this term. So this is exactly the same as linear theory. And we have these contributions from Newton potential. So then you get nonlinear corrections. So this is a very natural extension of linear equations we used. That's good because we didn't use any assumptions about gravity. The only information of gravity or dark energy is indeed encoded in this potential. So I can use these equations for any dark energy model, assuming that there is a conservation of this energy momentum tensor for dark matter. Okay. So this is a way to extend linear theory to nonlinear theory. So in order to understand what happens nonlinearly, the problem is that that equation is fully nonlinear, so it's very difficult to solve. But there is one special situation where you can solve this nonlinear equation exactly in an analytical way. So I will explain a little bit about this and how we extend this to general dark energy model. So this is to assume the spherical symmetry. I'm sorry for the equations, but um, I need to change variables again, first using this log A. So this is just changing the variables. So from conformal time to this variable. And then I use a new derivative known as the convective derivative. So this is the total derivative. So this is using the fact that the density at the position of the fluid is the function of time but remember that the fluid is moving. So this is position of the fluid also depends on time. So if you want to take the derivative with respect to eta, you have to first take the derivative with respect to time, but then you have to take derivative with respect to the space coordinate. So this is the part dealing with time dependence here. The only reason I'm doing this is that then the equation is simplified. So this is the same equation using this new derivative. And you arrive at these equations. So then looking at this, in order to find the solutions, we want to write down everything in terms of theta. But we still have this part. And this part cannot be written by theta because theta is the divergence. So theta is the uh, divergence of the velocity. And looking at this tensor structure, you cannot write this down in terms of theta. The good thing about spherical symmetry is that the velocity is isotropic. So this means that this term vanishes. So this term disappears. So this means that all equations can be written by theta, and you can derive the second order differential equations for delta. So forget about all the derivations. You get this second order uh, equations. Again, good thing is that neglecting all the nonlinear terms like this, and this delta times number of square psi, this is the equation we used for linear theory. Okay? So this is the extension of linear theory, but now you can include nonlinear terms. 
And this is now the ordinary differential equations, so you can solve it. And this uh, equation is indeed coming from a very simple picture of spherical clocks. So let's look at the uh, spherical object with radius initially a scale factor times R0, and you have some cosmological background. And this region just expands due to the expansion of the universe. But now you consider the situation that you have the same mass, but within the smaller radius R. Okay? So you put your mass inside this outside sphere into this small sphere. So then see what happens. So this spherical shell first expand due to the expansion of the universe, but then you have the density perturbations because you put more mass into the, this uh, sphere. So then due to gravity, uh, this sphere will collapse. Okay. This is described by this simple Newtonian equation. The acceleration of this object is determined by Newtonian force. So this is a very simple physics. And then I need to separate the Newtonian potential coming from the background and coming from this inhomogeneous density inside the sphere. And then the density perturbation is determined by the ratio of this radius because we put more mass inside this smaller radius. So if delta is zero, this means that the R is the same as A times R zero, so there is no density. So you can compute density perturbations in this way. And this is a very good exercise. So by doing this definition, you can derive these equations. Okay. So try this one if you are interested in this. So basically, this means that uh, you are solving a very simple physics. It's just a Newtonian physics. So let's look at the simplest case with lambda CDM and even forget about lambda. So the scale factor is given by time to the two third. So this is the expand, expansion without lambda. And this equation becomes very familiar Newtonian physics. So the acceleration of this shell is determined by gm over r squared Newton force. Okay. So maybe you can easily solve this by integrating once. So this m is the uh, mass within this radius then you can do the integration once, and then you can find the solution for time and r in terms of this tau variable. So this is the analytic solution. You can even compute the density analytically in terms of this tau, and I fixed this constant assuming that delta is zero initially. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so the good thing about this is that everything is analytic, so now you can understand what happens. So this is the radius of this sphere. So sphere expands due to the expansion of the universe, but at some point, due to the inhomogeneity, this shell collapses. So there is a turn around radius, so then once this shell expands, at some point, shell becomes collapsing, and eventually it goes to zero. So this is a spherical collapse, okay? And you compute the density, so this is the density. And you compute the density, it's not easy to see, but this uh, uh, line is the nonlinear density. And you can also compute the linear density, so you linearize everything, so this is basically the linear density proportional to scale factor. So this is the linear density. This is a nonlinear density. So you see that once the density becomes nonlinear, they behave very different way. And eventually, if the shell collapses, you get the infinite density. And the often used uh, number is that you can basically measure when this collapse of the object happens. And you can estimate this using this linear density. So you can estimate this time, and you extrapolate this linear density up to this point. Of course, the real density is diverging, 
but you can extrapolate your linear density and find that this happens when linear density is 1.686. So if you just use linear theory, of course, linear theory is not correct, but you can extrapolate your theory, then you find that uh, this collapse happens when delta is 1.686. And we want to know the effect of dark energy on this number, for example. But of course, in reality, we don't have singularities. So if this spherical shell collapses, of course, density is infinity. So you mean that uh, you have a singularity. But this does not happen in reality. In reality, what happens is a bilialization. So according to the bilial theorem, there is a stable point when the uh, potential energy and the kinetic energy satisfies this relation. So this is the bilial theorem. And assuming that the potential is inverse function of R, so this is the assumption. So this is valid for lambda CDM. This condition is given by this equation. So the potential energy plus two times kinetic energy is zero, then the system is stabilized. You don't see this in the spherical collapse because you assume that everything is spherical, but in reality you have a velocity diversion, uh, dispersions inside this sphere. And once this condition is satisfied, in fact, you don't get this collapse as uh, this uh, spherical shell becomes stable. And you can estimate when this happens using the total energy conservations. So the total energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy. At this turn around radius, there is no kinetic energy because the velocity is zero. So the total energy just comes from potential energy. So now you want to know when this periodization happens, you use the total energy at periodized time is potential energy plus kinetic, time, kinetic energy. But then you know that to have a periodization, kinetic energy must be minus potential energy half. So using that, this is one half of the potential energy at PDR radius. So remember that I assume that the potential energy scales like one over R, so this means that PDR radius must be half of the turn around radius. So this is a very simple argument, and then you see that, um, so this is a turn around radius because I normalized this by turn around radius. Then it, the radius becomes one half of this, then it PDRizes means that the, it becomes a stable object. So this is what we call dark matter halos. Okay? So this is the formation of dark matter halos. And you can estimate the density, nonlinear density at this time. So this is the number uh, 178 in the matter-dominated universe. So the beauty of spherical collapse is that everything can be done analytically, and you can quite easily understand the physics. So it's quite good exercise to extend this to the dark energy model and see if that happens. For example, you can extend this analysis to the smooth dark energy very easily because there is no funny clustering of dark energy. Your physics is the same, right? So you consider a spherical shell. This spherical shell is controlled by the Newton potential. This is coming from the inhomogeneity inside the shell and the expansion of the universe. And the smooth dark energy just changing the expansion of the universe, and then basically this term gives the additional contribution from dark energy density in the background. So this is the only modification. So then you can solve everything, in this case numerically, but you can easily find, for example, the effect of equation of state for this uh, density at the collapse, collapse time, so this is the linear density. I said this is 1.68 in the matter dominated universe. But changing the omega matter, this number changes, so this is the effect of lambda. And if you change the equation of state, this will change the, uh, this density. But you can compute this in an analytic way using spherical collapse model.
You can also calculate the BDRI's density. It was 178 in the matter dominated the universe. So if let's shift is two, universe is dominated by dark matter. So lambda CDM, the BDR over density is 178. But then lambda becomes important, BDR density becomes larger. And you can also compute the effect of the equation of state. So this is a very good way to understand the effect of dark energy equation of state on the nonlinear structures. So the application of this technique to the more complicated theory is, in fact, very difficult. But it can be done for some cases, like clustering dark energy. So in the clustering dark energy case, dark energy clusters. So not only dark matter, the dark energy is clustering. And in fact, if sound speed is very small, dark energy clusters. And basically, you cannot distinguish between dark energy and dark matter. And in this case, uh, you can compute the effect on this clustering dark energy. So this is, again, the collapse density. This is 1.686 for uh, matter-dominated universe. This is lambda CDM. So this is the dark energy model with equation state minus 0 0.7. Now you can change the sound speed and then predict what happens. So this is one way to understand nonlinear crops. And in fact, this was done by Paolo. So if you have any questions, you have to ask Paolo. And, but modified gravity uh, the situation is more complicated because for this simple equation, I assume that the dynamics of this spherical shell is determined by just the mass inside this spherical shell. And this is known as the Barkov theorem. So in GR, there is a nice theorem saying that if you consider a spherical shell, you don't care about the environment. You just need to know what happens inside this sphere. But in modified gravities, basically this does not fold. And in fact, you have to worry about what happens outside this sphere culture. So this kind of calculations become a bit difficult, but still you can get some guess what can happen at nonlinear scales. Okay, so any questions about sphere collapse model? That's right, but on the background, it's dark energy, so equation of state is not zero. It's close to minus one. But perturbations behave like dark matter. Okay? So another way, this is just one slide to show that there's another analytic way which is useful, uh, especially for less if distortions, uh, is to use perturbation theory. So our task is to solve these horrible nonlinear equations. And one way I showed is to assume symmetry to make these ordinary differential equations. Another way to solve these equations perturbatively, assuming that delta is small, but want to increase the nonlinearity in a perturbative way. Clearly, this cannot be applied to free nonlinear system, but you can use this technique to include nonlinear effect to your linear theory predictions. The idea is very simple, just expand delta and theta order by order, assuming delta and theta are small. At the linear level, you get exactly the same equations I showed in the last lecture, you get the linear theory. But then in the next order, for example, this delta times theta, you get the nonlinear corrections, and you try to solve these nonlinear collections order by order. Again, as, as I said, this, uh, these equations are very general, so I do not assume any gravity theory. The only assumption is that the matter energy momentum tensor is conserved. The only problem is to predict this Newton potential. And this, in this approach, basically what you have to do is to find psi perturbatively in terms of delta. So everything is encoded in this relation. You have clustering dark energy. 
you have a nonlinear relation between psi and delta, then you have to expand this relation. Remember that in GR, lambda CDM, you have a linear Poisson equation, but this can be nonlinear in this complicated model. But in the perturbation theory approach, you expand everything, and then you compute the path spectrum order by order. So the first order is just using this linear perturbations. But then the next order, you can have a second order times second order contribution. You can have first order times third order contribution. So this is called P13. This is P22. So this is called one loop collections. And this is a nonlinear collections to the linear path spectrum. So by including this, you can improve your predictions, uh, including some nonlinear effect. And this approach is very useful if we want to apply this to the RSF distortions. Okay, so again, I forgot when I started. So I started uh, at 15. 15, okay. Okay, so, so far I discussed how to include nonlinearities uh, using fluid, but in fact, even the fluid approximation breaks down. Okay, so I treated the collection of dark matter particles as a fluid, but this is not the case on very small scales, and the fluid approximation breaks down. And what you have to do is to solve this Boltzmann equation. So basically, you have a distribution of this uh, dark matter particles. And this Boltzmann equation describing the evolution of distribution function in the phase space. So F depends on space time, time and space, but also the momentum. So momentum of this particle. So you have a distribution of this function. A definition is that if you integrate this function over momenta, you get density. And the evolution of this distribution function is described by a very simple principle that the distribution function is conserved. So this is conserved against the change of time, change of space, and change of momentum. The only complication comes from this dependence of momenta with respect to time. So here you have to use uh, geodesic equations. And then you can define velocity in this way. So if you multiply the momentum divided by mass and integrate over distribution function, you get velocity. And if you have two momenta, pi, pj, divided by mass squared, you get density times velocity times velocity, but then there is an additional contribution known as velocity divergence. So this is the new quantities you have. Then applying this to this equation, you get these equations. So you can do this order by order. And then the first equation you get is the continuity equation. So this is the same equation we had before. The second equation, you get the equation for velocity. So this is the same equation we had. So this part is the fluid equation. So you can solve using spherical collapse model or perturbation theory. The problem with it is this velocity dispersion. So to get velocity dispersion, you have to go to the next order. You get the evolution equation for velocity dispersion. But this equation contains another new parameters. So then you have to continue to all the orders. So this means that there is no way to truncate this equation. And the fluid approximation is assuming that these velocity dispersions are small you ignore this, then you just solve these two equations. But this is not the case on small scales. Okay? So at some point, fluid approximations break down, and you have to worry about these velocity dispersions. So how we do that? The only answer is n-body simulations. So you already had uh, excellent lectures on n-body simulations, so I don't repeat anything. Just say that the Anybody simulations are solving this collisionless Boltzmann equation using many particles. That's one way to do that. So you can calculate this velocity dispersions, for example, using this method. 
But just to emphasize what we need is the geodesics of dark matter particles. And you need to know the Newtonian potential. Okay. In the lambda CDM, Newton potential is determined by density, and density is just a collection of mass of dark matter particles. And a good thing about lambda CDM is that this equation is linear, meaning that you know the solution. So this is just one over R. So this is the reason why you can do the anybody simulations using this formula. And then uh, there are a lot of ways to speed up the simulations. However, in the clustering dark energy or modified gravity, this Poisson equation becomes very complicated. For example, in the uh, modified gravity models, this is one example. So you have a Poisson equation, but then you have this additional scalar field. And this additional scalar field can satisfy a very complicated nonlinear equations. Okay. So this is the uh, problem of this clustering dark energy and modified gravity models. So this part is the same. But the calculation of the force is very difficult because we cannot use this one over R formula. You have to solve these complicated uh, scalar field equations, and then you compute this additional force, and then you have to add this additional force here. But luckily, there are now anybody code that can do that. And in fact, there are a variety of anybody code uh, proposed. And basically, what they are doing is similar. So you have a distribution of dark matter particles. Okay? And you want to compute the force here. In lambda CDM, you just compute the potential. And then you can compute the force. But in the modified gravity models, you have additional scalar field. You have to solve the scalar field equations. So what we have to do is to prepare a mesh inside anybody simulations. And using this mesh, you, for example, solve the scalar field equations. You compute the scalar force, and you also compute the gravity, and add it together, and then move particles. And for this, we have to use a usually adaptive mesh technique. I guess you heard about this. So you define your mesh around these very dense regions. And you can solve scalar field using this adaptive mesh. And then you can find this uh, gravitational potential. And all of these codes are based on the lambda CDM code. Probably you heard about LAMSES. So the first one, third one, is based on LAMSES. The second one, by name, it is based on gadget. So now we have these extensions of anybody code so that we can study nonlinear clustering in these complicated models. So in the last uh, few minutes, I just, yeah. You mean the CASPI problem of dark matter, hello? Um, I think modified gravity does not solve that problem. <laughs> Because you enhance probably the gravity usually, and you get the more clustering. And in fact, um, it's the opposite way. So it doesn't solve that problem. But you can look at this kind of problem using simulations. My answer is that probably it doesn't solve, but yeah. Yeah, so the, I will show the example from the second order Eulerian perturbations. But at let's shift to zero, I guess k equals 0 0.1 is the kind of the limit of perturbation theory. So beyond k equals 0 0.1, you need anybody simulations. So let's look at the example of f of r gravity. And so I use a very simple model. You have lambda CDM plus some collections. And this collection scales like 1 over r. And these collections are determined by this parameter, fr0. 
And if it, this is zero, it's lambda CDM. So this is describing the deviation from lambda CDM. I already looked at the linear perturbations for this theory. So this theory, you are getting the enhanced force on small scales. So we can do the full simulations solving the full scalar field equations. So the scalar field is now this delta FR. So this is a scalar field. This is sourced by density. But there is the nonlinear potential. So this is complicated. But this is the nonlinear functions of delta FR. So this is the origin of the screening mechanism I talked about. So due to this nonlinear potential, as I will see, uh, this suppresses the scalar force on small scales. But you have to solve these nonlinear equations. To compare what is the effect of having this nonlinearity, you can also consider the model where you linearize this potential term, so you get the mass term. So this is the linear theory I used to describe linear theory. So instead of this full equations, I can also solve this linear equation for scalar field. And comparing the two, you can understand the effect of screening, so the nonlinear suppression of the scalar force. So this is the example of the simulations in this model. So this is a distribution of density with different parameters. So as I said, if this parameter is small, you go back to GR. So this is a distribution of density. And this is the distribution of the scalar field. And this is the distribution of Newton potential. So now you want to compare the scalar field and the Newton potential. So this scalar field give it, is uh, giving the additional force. So this enhances gravity. And for this parameter, for 10 to minus 4, you see that there is no suppression of scalar field compared with potential. In fact, there is a relation between phi and the scalar field. So this means that there is no suppression of the Higgs force. So gravity is enhanced. Okay. But making this parameter small, so this is a different model with 10 to minus 6, Comparing the two, you see that the scalar field has much smaller amplitude compared with Newton potential. So this is coming from the chameleon screening I talked about. So in this theory, there is a screening mechanism. Once you get this nonlinear structure, you suppress the additional force. The point is that in order to see this, you really need to do simulations. So it's very difficult to predict is using analytic method. So anybody simulations are probably the only way to understand this nonlinear physics. And this is very important because without this mechanism, you cannot satisfy solar system constraint. For comparison, if you remove this nonlinear interaction over the scalar field, you see that there is no suppression at all. So you still have the enhanced Higgs force. So this means that uh, this chameleon mechanism is working very fine. And you can also look at the time evolution of this chameleon effect. <laughs> and so at early times, the chameleon is very working. So the comparing scalar field and Newton potential, you see there is no scalar force. So chameleon is very active at early times, and you cannot see the difference between GR and this model because there is no scalar force. But at late times, for this choice of parameter, the chameleon mechanism is not strong enough. So you are getting a scalar force. At some point, chameleon ceases to exist. And then at late times, for this parameter, you get this enhanced force. But again, this time dependence you can see only by solving this nonlinear scalar field. Yes, yeah, so for this parameter, yes. So now you can look at the path spectrum and, and compare it with linear theory, and you can understand how bad the linear theory is. So this is looking at the difference between the path spectrum in lambda CDM and f of r gravity, so delta p. So I compute the path spectrum in this modified gravity model and subtract the lambda CDM path spectrum and divide it by 
lambda CDM power spectrum. So if this is zero, this means that it's the same as lambda CDM. Okay? And for 10 to minus 4, this line is a linear prediction. So this is what I talked about in the last lecture. So the black data is coming from full simulations, and the green data is coming from simulations without chameleon mechanism. So for 10 to minus 4, the chameleon is not very important today, so this is the result today. So this means that there is no difference between chameleon and the full simulation chameleon and the linear simulations, but you see that there is a huge difference between linear theory and the nonlinear theory. So this happens around like k equals one. But then if you make this parameter small, now you see that chameleon is working even today. So you see the difference between non-chameleon simulation and the chameleon simulations. For example, for 10 to minus six, this is the linear prediction. This is a simulation without chameleons, and this is a full simulation. So you see that in the full case, the deviation from lambda CDM is very small because of this screening mechanism. But if you do not use nonlinear simulations, you just use these linear predictions, you get a very wrong answer. So this means that you really need to understand this nonlinear physics if you want to change gravity. And just say that, then you say that, can you trust anybody simulations? That's another question. And recently, we have done the comparison between different code based on gadget, based on lumses. And up to k equals 1, we get 1% agreement. Does it mean we can trust the code? Probably not, because everyone can be wrong. right? But uh, we are using a different algorithm. We are using a different baseline anybody simulations. So gadget is, MG gadget is using gadget. So this uh, ISIS, a bit bad name, but uh, EcoSmoke <laughs> is using the uh, Lamases. So, um, so it's good that we get the same answer. So why this is important? So I said that we want to use less shift distortions so again, this is the power spectrum in less shift space. So this is the monopole, and this is the quadrupole. And this is from our simulations. So this is the predictions at z equals 1. This is wave number. So this is monopole and the quadrupole. And again, I divide by linear prediction. So linear prediction is here, and these are the simulation results. So again, the difference is the nonlinearity. So you have to model this nonlinearity properly if you want to test this model. But the good thing about less distortion is that you can use perturbative approach I talked about. And in fact, these lines, blue line and red lines, are coming from predictions from perturbation theory. So this is not from anybody simulations. You can use perturbation theory to predict, but you can see that this is valid only up to k equals 0.15. So validity regime is quite limited compared with simulations. But the thing is that you can compute this line using perturbation theory probably 1,000 times faster than anybody's simulation. And you need this because you cannot do simulations for all the cosmological parameters and all the modified gravity parameters. So perturbation theory is working very fine. That's the reason why this can be applied to real data. So we apply this to SDSS data, and we get the constraint from this parameter. So it's like 10 to minus 3. Yeah. So, these are, so this uh, dotted line is the usual one-loop standard perturbation theory. So this uh, solid line is the regularized perturbation theory. So there's a way to improve perturbation theory. So this is the one using some uh, technique to improve the perturbation theory. Now, so the 
on very large scales anyway, these techniques will fail. Sorry, move. Two loops. So the question is, so this is one loop. So this is what I showed. So two loops, in fact, you have to do the six-dimensional integrations. And this takes time. And sometimes maybe it takes more time to do simulations. So you need to be careful. There is a quick way to do that. So you need that technique to improve that. OK? So um, the next step uh, is to look at dark matter halos. So I talked about this dark matter halos in the spherical collapse model. And then you can predict the number density of these dark matter halos. So again, this is the difference between GR and F of R depending on the parameter. So this is, again, today. So this is the mass of the dark matter halos. So for 10 to minus 4, there is no chameleon mechanism. And gravity is enhanced, meaning that you get a huge numbers of massive halos. So this is 10 to 15 solar mass dark matter halos. Compared with GR, you have 100% more massive dark matter halos. But then if you make this parameter small, so this blue line is the full simulation result. You notice that the number of massive halos in this F of our gravity model is the same as GR. This is because chameleons. So chameleon mechanism suppresses the modification of gravity for massive halos. So this means that you don't see any modification. If you ignore this chameleon effect, you still have enhancement. So this is very important to be included. So again, spherical collapse model I talked about can predict this line. So this shaded line is the prediction of spherical collapse. As I said, it's very difficult to predict precisely, but still it can give some indications of what you expect. And this kind of analytic method is very important. And then you can see that you can constrain this parameter very well just looking at the abundance of clusters because we don't see this huge abundance of mass halos. And you can get this constraint. So the constraint is now like less than 10 to minus 5. So this is the constraint on this F of R gravity parameter, FR0. So you can combine many observations to constrain this parameter. I talked about ISW, CMB lensing, RSD. All this gives a constraint like 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4. By using cluster abundance, you get the much better constraint. So in this type of theory, in fact, nonlinear structures are the best way to constrain models. And to do that, you really need simulations. You need a very good analytical understanding of nonlinearities. OK, I think um, this is the uh, end of my fourth lecture. So any questions about the fourth lecture? Yeah. question is about finger of God. So what would you ascribe as the causes for the peculiar velocities at that region, 0 to 20 for megaparsec over H, which is where we see the finger of God effect? Yeah, so the finger of God effect is coming from this velocity divergence inside very small nonlinear structures, right? So, sorry, what was the question? Yeah. Uh, what would you ascribe as the causes for the velocities which cause the finger of God effect? Yeah, so the finger of God effect is the random motions, right? So this random motions is not caused by this velocity divergence. So it, it, it cannot be described by linear this coherent motion. So that's the reason why we get huge suppression of velocity divergence per spectrum. Uh, uh, one thing which uh, uh, I had tried seeing is uh, if you remove that region off and then try doing an analysis, let's say correlation function analysis, ah, okay. then it messes up all the parameters that includes uh, the alcohol paksinski parameter and things like that. Would you have any comment on why that happens? 
I don't know about that particular problem, so maybe we have to talk about it. But just say that when I showed the prediction from perturbation theory, I didn't say that, but I have a free parameters for finger of gold effect. So we have a velocity uh, dispersion parameter. I tuned it. So in this sense, we are, the understanding of this truly nonlinear finger of gold effect is very difficult. So somehow we treat this as a phenomenological way, giving a free parameter. Why, if we can remove it from your observations, of course, that's better. But maybe we can talk later. Thank you. Sorry, uh, clustering dark energy or smooth dark energy? Eh? Which of these scenarios is, are in better agreement with observation? Observations. Yeah. At the moment, I think it's very difficult to distinguish. So at the linear scales, as, as I said, this is described by mu and sigma parameter. So at the moment, we see some uh, deviations from lambda CDM smooth dark energy. But in fact, deviations say that gravity is weaker. And this is very difficult to do, either in the clustering dark energy or modified gravity, because you have to suppress gravity. And if you have a clustering dark energy, this enhances gravity. So at the moment, we have no idea how to do that. Any other question? I don't see any, so let's thank uh, Kazuya for his set of lectures. <laughs> Notice that uh, we're going to have a small break, so we, we just uh, start at 3.30, so it's...